August 16, 1989, Sydney, Australia. A new Boeing 747-400, the latest development of the 747 line, touches down at Sydney International Airport, having flown 11,178 miles from London in 20 hours, 9 minutes and 5 seconds, making it the longest non-stop airline flight in history. A new milestone in world travel, recorded in the year of the 747's 20th birthday. But the epic 747 story starts a long way from Sydney, Australia, in both space and time. On July 16, 1916, in Seattle, Washington, William Edward Boeing founded the Pacific Aero Products Company. In mid-1917, the U.S. entered the war against Germany, and Bill Boeing received an order for 50 of his Model C trainers. Before the end of the year, Pacific Aero Products had become the Boeing Airplane Company. In March 1919, Bill Boeing and his pilot Eddie Hubbard made the first international mail flight when they flew from Seattle to Vancouver. In 1928, the Boeing 80A was the last word in travel comfort, boasting the first flight nurse or stewardess. Metal fabrication improvements led to a series of metal-skinned, low-wing monoplanes like the XB-9. And by 1934, when Roscoe Turner flew a Boeing 247 from London to Melbourne, Australia, a true revolution in passenger air transport had arrived. In 1933, the 247 had cut the U.S. transcontinental flight time from 27 to 19 and a half hours. With her twin Pratt & Whitney Wasp engines, she was 50 to 70 miles an hour faster than any other airliner of the period. But the 247's advanced design led to its downfall, because when TWA went to Douglas to find a competitor, the DC series was born, and the DC-2 and 3 made the 247 virtually obsolete. Boeing now turned its attention to size with the four-engined XB-15, it was the first really big plane to use state-of-the-art technology in streamlining and high-performance power plants. Only one XB-15 was built, but Boeing had established itself as a manufacturer of big aircraft. When one trip of Pan American Airlines approached Boeing to build a big flying boat to fly the intercontinental passenger routes, the engines and wing design of the XB-15 were adapted to fit the new hull and the Model 314 Boeing Clipper was born. The Clipper was big. It had a gross weight of 82,500 pounds and a payload of over 15 tons of fuel, passengers, and cargo. They cost $700,000 each and took 350,000 man-hours to build. The Clipper was the first major step toward Juan Tripp's vision of cheap international travel. With its range and capacity to carry two shifts of flight crew, it made regular scheduled transatlantic services possible. At the same time, Boeing was moving in another direction, upward. It had designed and built Project 299, the prototype of the Flying Fortress B-17, using the idea of four engines and a smaller fuselage than the XB-15 in order to improve performance. The B-17 wings and tail assembly were given a cigar-shaped, pressurized fuselage to produce the four-engined Stratoliner. A supercharger provided oxygen for high-altitude engine performance and fed pressurized air to the passenger cabin. It wasn't the first four-engined airliner, but it was the first pressurized airliner to enter service. One trip from Pan American ordered four Stratoliners and TWA ordered five. The first Stratoliner flew on December 31, 1938. It created great excitement with its ability to fly at 26,000 feet and carry 33 passengers. But a plane that seemed destined for greatness was not to have everything its own way. A bad crash of Stratoliner No. 1 led to the fitting of a dorsal fin to improve stability and the outbreak of World War II interrupted the development of international travel. The development of superchargers, pressurization, and later turbo superchargers were all to make a contribution to the development of the Boeing line of big bombers. 
12,000 B-17s were built, and they played a major role in the Allied war effort, not only dropping bombs, but shooting down almost as many enemy planes as all other American warplanes combined. Then came the biggest of the World War II bombers, the B-29 Super Fortress, with its pressurized fuselage. Its impact on military history culminated with the dropping of the bomb that ended the war. After the war, its transport counterpart, the C-97, evolved into the Stratocruiser, Boeing's ultimate in big piston engine international airliners. In 1945, William Allen, the new president of Boeing, had realized the need for Boeing to get back into the production of civil aircraft. He gambled and announced the building of 50 at a million dollars each. The Stratocruiser was the ultimate in luxury international travel in an era before the introduction of economy and tourist fares. Its most famous feature was the spiral staircase leading down to the lower deck lounge where passengers could stretch their legs and enjoy a change of scenery. And there was also the ladies' lounge, a convenient facility for keeping up in-flight appearances. The Stratocruiser's major competitors at this time were from Lockheed and Douglas. They were, like this constellation, essentially pre-war designs. There were also other planes like the British Hermes flying the international routes. Post-war international air travel had not boomed in the way many experts had predicted, and the luxury of spanning the miles between continents at any time of the day or night was only available to a privileged minority. In May 1952, the British de Havilland Comet began a service from London to Johannesburg, but the design ran into trouble before Comet could be introduced to the transatlantic run. The future of jet international travel was given a boost by the need for a new in-flight tanker. The old Boeing KC-97 was fine for refueling piston-driven planes, but it was too slow to cope comfortably with the new generation of Boeing long-range jet bombers. The B-47 first flew in 1947. It had six General Electric J-35 turbojets slung in pods under the swept-back wing. The concept of a global defensive weapon required huge flying ranges, a need shared by the next generation, the B-52 Stratofortress. For the concept to work, an efficient in-flight refueling system was essential, and the result was another major gamble for Boeing. Dash 80 was a completely new design. A low-wing, swept-wing monoplane with four Pratt & Whitney J3 engines, she was a double prototype. She became the KC-135 tanker, but she also broke away from her military destiny as the Boeing 707, America's first international jet airliner. But soon, the 707s on transatlantic routes were joined by DC-8s from Douglas. Passenger numbers began to soar by 12% a year, and Douglas introduced a stretched version of the DC-8 to cope with increased demand. The 707 was not readily stretchable, but at that point, fate intervened with the U.S. Air Force competition to build a very large transport plane, the C-5A. Boeing, always ready to build a bigger plane, threw itself into the contest, and this animation shows its design approach. It was given top priority, and a design team of 500 men set to work on the concept in June 1964. A detailed proposal went from Boeing to the U.S. Air Force within four months. Boeing, with its experience in the production of big planes, was thought to have the edge over its competitors, Lockheed and Douglas. But a year later, in September 1965, the word came out. Boeing, with all its knowledge of big plane construction, had quoted too high a price, and Lockheed had won the contract to build what became the C-5A Galaxy. But what was a blow to Boeing at the time became a major factor in the future of international jet travel. You know, when you're competing on something as large as the C-5A, if we had won that contract, it would have absorbed a great deal of our energy, and we probably would not have gone forward with the 747 at that time, and then later. 
However, the fact that we lost it uh, and that released a fair amount of energy and resources to do something else, uh, we were anxious to get moving and it, in a sense, probably accelerated our going into the 747, which it turned out to be a very attractive uh, decision. The 747 concept grew out of much consultation with airlines around the world, and William Allen, the Boeing president, was the man who recommended that building proceed, but there were no firm orders for the plane. Juan Tripp of Pan American Airlines, who'd had a prominent place in the history of the Boeing Clipper, the Stratoliner, and Stratocruiser, was once again about to tie himself to Boeing's destiny. Well, Juan Tripp got intrigued uh, in it, and Bill Allen and the two, uh, himself, they, they said, well, what about it? And our, our designers said, we can design and build it. And he said, if, if you can build it, I'll buy it. And between the two of them, they struck sort of a deal that they sort of sealed with a handshake. If, they, uh, if we would go ahead, I believe the timing uh, was, this was in February of 66, if, uh, if we'd agree to build the airplane, that he would buy it. We said, well, we'd have to have orders from at least three airlines. For 50 aircraft and uh, if that was the case we go ahead in August 1st of 1966 at that time we did not have uh, signed contracts I believe for the 50 but we were close enough and we were already enraptured with the concept so we went ahead I believe that Juan trip in order to ensure that we were serious about it more or less bet Bill Allen 10 million dollars that he wouldn't go ahead it wasn't so much a bet, I think it was a, it was a, <laughs> it was a, if you didn't do it, you'd have to pay the money. But uh, we did go ahead, so we didn't have to pay the $10 million. On July 25th, 1966, the Boeing Company decided to convert this forest into one of the biggest manufacturing complexes in the world. The company decided to erect here the largest factory, volume-wise, ever built in order to assemble the largest commercial jet airplane in aviation history. The plane was the giant 747, six stories high, 231 feet long, with a wingspan wider than a football field two and a third times larger than a four-jet 707. And the time? For the first plane, only 31 months from go-ahead to roll-out. But for the factory, time compressed even more. Nine months until fabrication of the first part for the first plane had to begin. Challenges of the factory came first. Challenges posed by the necessity of building that first part on time of keeping one step ahead of the growing plane. Timbered hilltops had to be smashed into valleys to make way for the factory. 630 acres of undeveloped ridges and trees had to be leveled before the job was finished. More than 250 contractors, subcontractors, and material contractors became involved in the project. The contractor labor force on the site alone reached 2,800 men, representing every craft in the Puget Sound area. Well, as, as far as a, a financial risk or a business risk, it was, uh, you'd have to say it was awesome, I guess, because Obviously, what the money it took to develop, design, and build the prototype airplanes and then build a production rate up was far in excess of the net worth of the entire company. So uh, we were betting the company uh, on the success of the airplane. The railroad, second steepest in the nation, lifts trains as high as Seattle Space Needle, more than 500 feet, from Puget Sound to factory level in less than three miles. Speedy construction of the $2 million railroad was essential. The line would be required initially for hauling material to the construction site and later for moving parts and equipment to factory assembly lines. We threw many men and, and much equipment into that gulch in order to build that railroad. It was tough to get the ballast down and to get the tracks laid. It was thought that we could never do it, but we were able to bring it out on schedule. 
the head of facilities for me, a fellow named Bain Lamb, that was building this world's largest building. Uh, he, uh, he used to be a quarterback on the University of Washington Huskies, and I had been a guard at Georgia Tech, and he never liked taking orders from a guard anyway, but he came to me one day and he said, you know, we're not going to get that on time. <clears throat> And I said, the devil, we're not, you know, what do you need? You know, he said, well, I need more people. And I said, you've got them. And then he said, uh, I need more uh, equipment, you know, our earth moving car. I said, you've got it. And he said, I, I need more money. He said, don't bother about it. You, you, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll get it for you. And he said, I need two weeks of clear weather. And I said, you've got it, you know. And then, well, uh, as it turned out, God got even because he'd rained 67 days in a row. There were always problems. No sooner had clearing begun than rains swept the site. Equipment mired down. We found that this glacier till that is so hard also turned to grease. We couldn't work, obviously, in the mud, so we paved about 100 acres under the buildings. Then we were able to work out of the dirt and out of the mud. Size and speed of the project demanded rigid controls at every turn. As director of facilities, Bain Lamb explains. Every single thing that goes on in the project is scheduled and planned in this room. We can tell in an instant whether or not we are ahead or behind schedule. Total visibility on every phase of the project. Early in the project, planners realized that overlapping occupancy would cause problems. The contractors we knew were going to be in an area adjacent to our people, overhead, in the structures, in the towers, under floor, in the trenches and the ducts. At the same time, Boeing people would be trying to produce the parts that would later go into the airplane. Meanwhile, Joe Sutter, chief project engineer for the 747, had spent over a year with his team finalizing the plane design to make sure that mock-up construction could begin as soon as the building was ready or, if necessary, even before that. The instant it became possible, crews moved inside. While office walls were being installed inside one of the towers, crews continued working on the roof. As electricians strung cable and trusses, steel workers draped another wall on the side of the building. The mock-up building was due to be occupied in mid-winter, January 1967. We realized early that we were not going to be able to turn over a completed facility. It would be not heated, would be wide open on one end. The floors would still be curing out. The shell is about all we had to deliver. But despite the cold, crews moved in. They were wearing gloves and their mackinaws and their hard hats. They were very, very uh, motivated, uh, the workforce. There was no need to uh, try to energize them. They were on a, for a very romantic task to build the world's largest airplane. And they would, um, we had people that would drive all the way from Tacoma, which is, a, a, you know, 70 miles away, to get to Everett to work on the aircraft. Uh, they uh, had an enthusiasm that welled up, and finally someone uh, coined the word that they were the Incredibles. And, trying to think of who decided, but they got Paul, a Paul Bunyan uh, insignia and put it on their hard hats. Uh, they had to work on hard hats because the building was still under construction and on their lunch bales and they had them on their jackets and what have you. And they uh, really did a yeoman's job. Yeah. Beyond 2000, Thursdays at 9 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> to bring the literally millions of parts of the plane together in the right place at the right time. The factory was virtually a city in itself. It was the world's largest building in cubic capacity, covering 43 acres under one continuous roof. It housed thousands of workers and had its own food and medical facilities. A stage as big as 40 football fields, only waiting now for the appearance of its principal player, a player whose lines had been polished and refined over many months by many people, all striving to make sure that everything would be all right when the curtain went up on opening night. The whole job started way back down the line when engineers were still looking at paper airplanes and models. 
and wind tunnel testing began. Our people devote literally thousands of hours of their time and both on paper and in the wind tunnel to minimize drag because drag is money. Drag costs weight, drag costs fuel. In the months of early development, Joe Sutter and his team experimented with nearly 50 different possible shapes, including this double-decker mid-wing configuration. Millions of dollars were spent on wind tunnel testing, and every aerodynamic parameter was measured and recorded. Boeing needed an entirely new engine to power the 747, and they got it from Pratt & Whitney, who'd been working on a similar but smaller concept for the C-5A competition. It was called a high bypass ratio engine, a development of the Fanjet, model JT-9D. It produced 43,500 pounds of thrust, about 87,000 horsepower. Pratt & Whitney had to test the engine without a finished plane, so they leased a B-52 from the Air Force and modified it to install a JT-9D in place of two of the B-52's normal engines. In the flight test program, the B-52 from the Air Force flew at altitudes of over 45,000 feet and under extreme conditions, the engine was given a clean bill of health. This device, called the Praying Mantis, was designed to give pilots the experience of taxiing the 747 from a cockpit 29 feet above the ground. The 747's chief test pilot, Jack Waddell, was heavily involved in this preliminary testing. And he could, with practice, park it next to a cargo dock with a plus or minus six inch tolerance. It proved to many 747 customers that the huge plane would not be an uncontrollable horror around airports. The prospect of emergency evacuation from an unusual height was also faced early in the 747's development, and pilots were given an opportunity to fly in a simulator that used a remotely controlled TV camera, scanning an accurately scaled terrain model. In the simulator, the pilot had control of speed, altitude, and attitude, matched as closely to the behavior of the big plane as the designers could predict. The full-scale mock-up of the 747 was built as an engineering tool to test every part and system that would find its way into the completed aircraft, just to make sure that all four and a half million pieces in the jigsaw puzzle would fit. Given that the puzzle pieces would be coming from many different subcontractors from many different locations inside and outside the U.S., the successful assembly of such a giant jigsaw posed enormous planning and logistical problems for the management team, who had to make sure it all fell accurately into place on the 43-acre floor of the Everett factory back in Washington State. As you know, there's literally millions of pieces in the airplane and, uh, and parts, and they were coming from almost all of the 50 states and 17 foreign countries, and so that you had a tremendous logistics problem to get all of these designs and parts and schedules to mesh to bring a, together a line that was finally going to end up to being building a 747 every three days, uh, roughly, there on a <clears throat> seven-a-month schedule. And we work, as you know, 22 days a month. So it was a tremendous, you know, problem and complexity. And we were just, computers weren't really available in the same dimension they are now. And so we were doing a lot of this uh, with older techniques. And so it was, a, it was an awesome job to keep track of the parts and make sure everything got designed right and tested and put into the airplane. The scale and innovative nature of the project meant that many new materials and engineering techniques had to be designed and developed. A huge machine shop was established at Auburn, south of Seattle, to make precision tools and giant jigs which couldn't be acquired any other way. 
New, highly complex riveting machines were built to operate with greater speed and accuracy than had been required by any past manufacturing processes. Without this kind of innovation to speed up the 747 project, manufacture would not have been economically possible. And now, the moment of truth. The assembly of 747 number one is underway. The nose section has arrived from the Boeing plant at Wichita. The big pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are coming together. The systems that were designed in theory many months before are now being tested in practice, and the test is very severe. At this time, the tolerances demanded of the engineering process are the most exacting ever asked of the aircraft industry. The level of tension on the factory floor mounts. These people have committed themselves fully to the project, and now 747 number one is beginning to emerge as a whole plane from the sum of its millions of parts. The tail, the height of a six-story building, many times higher than the altitude reached by the Wright brothers on their first flight, is lowered into place. From the tip of the tail to the tip of the nose, it is also longer than the distance flown by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk in 1903. But even with the fuselage and wings assembled, the building process is far from complete. There are 135 miles of wire in a Boeing 747, and much of it has to be fitted by hand. 75,000 engineering drawings had to be used for the full project, and all assembly instructions had to be followed right to the letter. The 747 hydraulic system is designed for safety. Backup systems compensate for one another in the event of failure. Putting everything together in the time available was a colossal task. I can remember it being a uh, all-encompassing job. We spent 365 days a year working on it and seven days a week. I think we would have averaged something like 12, 14, 16 hours a day. I mean, the, the management. Some people said, I don't understand how uh, Boeing can put an our airplane out in four years. Well, another way is we, <laughs> we did it in eight, but we crammed it into four. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a compelling job, and everybody that worked on it was sort of a, was swept up into the enthusiasm for doing it. 74, so I've been flying a 747 now for approximately 16 years. 26 months ago, as we stood amidst the forest up here at Everett, and the decision was made to go forward with the 747 program, the magnitude of the task that we were faced with really looked formidable. Monday, September 30th, 1968, Bill Allen sees his vision realized. We have an airplane now, a remarkable one. Let us move forward to see it in service on the airlines. And now, now, let's see the airplane. For Malcolm Stamper, the big moment. All right, man. Some people who were there on that day recall that at first the plane didn't look very big until it got closer. Twenty-six stewardesses, representing the 26 airlines that have ordered 158 747s, take part in the christening ceremony. Organizing the christening may well have been Malcolm Stamper's most difficult management task. All right, now we're going to uh, christen her, as you know, on a count of three. 
Yeah, don't do it yet, but on one, you're going to pick the bottle up. Two, over our shoulders. Three, all the way down. Okay? Now the cadence, don't break it yet. The cadence is going to be one, two, three. Got it? Okay, wait, wait. The 747, in order to get it ready for the traveling public, uh, we really torture the planes. We build two airplanes that we destroy in, in the process. One of them uh, we call a fatigue test airplane, and we actually put it in a harness and fly it for the equivalent of uh, 30 years, uh, let's say, 60,000 hours, and we make it take off and land and so forth and so on over and over again. And anything that fails or breaks over time, uh, we fix and then put it into the production line, the improvements. We also take the airplane and break another airplane and break it up in pieces. Uh, we want to know what it takes to break a wing. If you take uh, the wing of a 747, you can deflect it 29 feet at the tip before it breaks. And that's quite a, you know, that's quite a scene to watch it when it finally lets go. I mean, it, <laughs> it sounds like an explosion. We break the tail off. We, we go through a complete destruction of the airplane, finding its real strength. We have all sorts of difficult tests. We'll take the 747 and, and purposely drag its tail on the runway to make sure that uh, it will take off in that mode if uh, the pilot over-rotated the airplane. The VMU tests determine the maximum performance of the aircraft in the takeoff configuration. They're performed by placing the tail section of the aircraft in contact with the runway until the airplane lifts off. The speed which it lifts off is called the minimum unstick speed, or VMU. So the VMU then determines the basically the takeoff performance of the aircraft. It also determines the ability of the airplane to tolerate inadvertent abuse. In the case of the 747, it's impossible to abuse the airplane enough so that it doesn't lift off cleanly with very good flying qualities. We actually do it a rejected takeoff test where we lock the brakes and freeze out the anti-skid devices. Uh, what happens is the, 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 the brakes are locked so the, the tires actually burn off and it actually burns the wheels off and it sits finally and it catches fire. And you have to sit in the plane for five minutes without touching it. The fire trucks are there to see if passengers are there that have time to get off and then you're allowed to put out the fire. This is a, we pay the pilots a little extra for this. <laughs> During these high-speed flutter tests, the airplane was shown to be highly stable, and we reached maximum Mach number speeds of 0.99, which is 99% of the speed of sound, and as high as 685 miles per hour, true airspeed. The 747 has a landing gear that is forgiving and whereas that rate of sink in another airplane might have felt like a moderately hard landing the 747 it will feel soft i think it's a very forgiving airplane on landing on all our airplanes we have a system on the uh, connected to the brakes that makes it possible for the pilot to apply brake pedal and not worry about skidding the wheels and then blowing some tires. This protective system is on all our airplanes and on all our airplanes we demonstrate the operation of the, la of the airplane during landings and during refused takeoffs with the system working and with it in various failure conditions. One failure condition is with two wheels not connected to the anti-skid system and then we also check it with all wheels not protected with the anti system and try to show performance of the airplane under these conditions. I thoroughly enjoy flying the airplane. I get a, a big charge out of it and enjoy it. It has no bad characteristics. It's an honest airplane, and I'm not just saying that from a sales standpoint. I think it's, it's really a good airplane from a piloting and also from a passenger standpoint.
be on board the massive ships that changed the course of naval warfare. From the early models to the ultra-modern, look back on Carriers at 8. Then, at 8.30, combat from the soldier's point of view. You'll hear first-hand accounts of World War II hardship and triumph from the pages of G.I. Diary. Thursdays, beginning at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Well, I think it's one of the top uh, largest airplanes in the world. Uh, I have not had the opportunity to fly the uh, C-5A. I know some people that have flown it. And uh, I, personally, I'll take the 747. It's, uh, it, it's sort of like putting on a comfortable pair of shoes uh, after 16 years, and I have about five more years to go to retire. And uh, I like my comfortable shoes in that 747. The 747 was now in service, and the factory went into full production. But development continued, and within a year, the first new model, the 200B, was in the air. The only obvious external change was the number of windows on the top deck. It retained the basic 747 look, and the 747's easy approach to its task of spanning the skies of the world. Before any 747 can be painted, it has to be wheeled across the freeway next to the Everett factory, next to the paint shop. It's a challenging sight for any passing driver unfamiliar with the area. Masking the fuselage surface can be a highly complex job, depending on the markings of the airline involved. And then, more than 70 gallons of paint for any white-topped version of the plane. And some are more decorative than others. In the first class, too, decor can range from simply functional to highly romantic. I think at uh, last count we may have been building uh, nine or ten different uh, models of the 747 because uh, you need them for different things. For instance, the, the Japanese who had uh, a regional uh, length stage route for the planes uh, flying between their various provinces wanted a plane that took off and landed quite frequently. So we went in and changed the landing gear and the flap system to accommodate that and called it a short range uh, 747, 747SR. People wanted to fly freight and passengers, and so we made a part of it. We put cargo doors on the side and allowed them to, uh, you know, put large uh, containers into the aircraft. We had uh, uh, people that wanted to fly nothing but freight, so we built freighters uh, where we opened the nose of the airplane up, and you can load these eight by eight foot containers that would be the size of a huge truck trailer into the aircraft and fly it. And that has become a large uh, business. We had. Uh, uh, a plane, the Pan Am, wanted to fly longer distance, farther and faster. So we wanted one that would climb higher and have uh, higher speeds. And so we built an SP, Special Performance, it was called. And we took a section of it out, so it was a shorter airplane. So... 747 SR, 747 Combi, 747 SP. What is the significance of the number 747? Well, Boeing has always had sevens in their in their uh, aircraft numbering, uh, B-17, uh, even the <laughs> the uh, B-52. If you add five and two together, you get seven, I guess. So that may be a little bit of mystique. And we built a 707. 
uh, which, by the way, had four engines and then built a 727, which had three engines, and a 737 that had two engines. So you, you can't make any sense out of this except the 747 was next in line for the number, and so we used it for 747 has four engines. <laughs> Today, the 747 has become the most recognized airplane in the world, and it has brought about a complete revolution in international travel. Actually, the 747, and we, we talk of it in cents per seat mile, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's inexpensive enough now to make it open for everyone. Everyone can fly today. Part of the revolution has taken place in the airports themselves. Terminal design requirements have exploded in order to handle the number of people on the ground. Stairways have given way to air bridges and baggage carousels are everywhere. Over 700 747s have been built and all but a few of them are still flying. They belong to over 70 different airlines and organizations around the world. The plane has had an immense influence on the way we all look at world travel. Since 1968, it has pulled the continents closer together and dramatically increased the number of people who look at world travel as an everyday and readily affordable fact of life. Over 800 million of us have flown in it, and that number is climbing at an ever-increasing rate. When the 747 was being developed, there were concerns that it would overload airport passenger and baggage facilities and overstress runways and taxiways. It took a while to solve the passenger side of things, and some travelers would contend there's still a problem. But the 747 has never been hard on airport surfaces, placing no more stress on runways than a 707. And while there have been accidents in the air, the overall safety record of the plane is excellent. What started out as our, our, you know, the, our greatest risk turned out to be our greatest reward. The 747 has been a marvelous product for Boeing and for the flying public. Uh, it's been it's exceeded our fondest expectations. It's been very effective for us, profitable for us. It's allowed us to have the the resources, if you will, to gain the resources to build new airplanes, the 767, the 757, very advanced designs. It's allowed us to put those kinds of improvements back into the 747, and as you'll notice, it has winglets on it now, and of course, if you could get inside the electronics, you'd find it was all digitized, very, very uh, modern aircraft. So it's, it's uh, what looked like a really big gamble turned out to be a really big gain. So, the 747 has been a familiar sight in the skies for over 20 years, and it looks as though it will be around in one form or another for a long time to come. The 747 was a great uh, challenge for me, obviously, and as I look back on a, a career full of interesting and wonderful challenges, it's the number one task I've ever had to do, and, uh, and it was a thrill to be a part of it. I, like, I mean, Bill Allen, I... I pleased with the confidence he had in putting me in charge of it. Uh, I worked with a fabulous group of people in designing and building it. It's been a wonderful experience. He uses tree sap to repair his canoe. He fashions gravel and leather into homemade sandpaper. He is scientist and outdoorsman Andre Francois Bourbeau. And his story of survival in the wild is next on Challenge.